This is the first time I've done this particular presentation, um, so I've really got no idea what's going to happen. Um, we may be done in half an hour, we may still be here at half past eleven, having gone through all the water's time as well. But we will um, we'll see how it goes. Um, there's always a little bit of PowerPoint, and then I'm going to do what I enjoy doing best, which is sit and type and play with some software and show you what some software does. This whole ride thing um, is something that, that we've come up with to solve to solve a number of problems, and we'll, we'll go through those um, just to give you the background about why we're doing this. The problem mainly is, is of our own making. Uh, Dialog APL has this feature-rich, um, interactive, um, idea, interactive development environment, which has evolved over the past, well, 20 years probably. I've been working on it for 18 years. And what we're seeing is that now it's getting very difficult to maintain this, this UI idea that we have um, on all the platforms that we ought to support the interpreter on. Um, I know it's difficult because it's typically me that has to do it. Um, <coughs> so we have a problem where we've got all of this GUI stuff and getting it onto all the different devices that are out there is, is proving to be um, very difficult. And of course now with APR Sharp we have um, an additional language, uh, an additional dialogue language that we need an IDE for and um, you know we want to address that issue so that when APL Sharp is available that you guys have a, a, a development environment with which um, to, to explore that new language. Now the other problem that we try to solve here is all down to Bill. Um, I'll explain this as we go through the slides but, but on Windows Vista and Windows 7 Bill's getting in the way of some of the things that we need to do. Bill being Bill Gates, I know he's not there anymore, but if you're in the dialogue office and someone shouts in a rather aggravated fashion, oh, Bill! <laughs> what we mean is Windows is doing something that we don't like. So we've got various platforms. We've got Windows, of course, now, where we have Windows on the desktop, we have Windows <coughs> Mobile on phones and other devices. There are various Linux platforms now, and in the past we've used things like Wine to provide our Windows <coughs> GUI on the Linux platforms. It's sort of okay, it's, it's, not, it's not completely bug free, it's not without difficulties all of its own. Before we used Wine, we used Mainwing, which <coughs> is a big black box of tricks that sometimes does what it's supposed to do, some more frequently doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Again, it's a toolkit for providing a Windows IDE on a Linux machine. <coughs> Plainly that, on all Unix systems, we have what we call the TTY versions of the interpreter, where there's no graphical user interface, there's a text-based uh, user interface. <coughs> and a lot of the features we have in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the GUI IDE, we just cannot provide on those TTY versions, because when you're working with an 80 by 45 character matrix, it's difficult to get across those, those GUI features. Of course, then there's other platforms which, which we really want to get interpreters on. Phones, pads, and pods. Pones, pads, and pods, let's say, sounds better. You've got the iPhone, the iPad, the iPod, and of course, there are all these others, all these other tablet devices that are coming out that we want to get APLs on, and ideally, we want to have development environments on so that you can be sitting on the plate, sitting at the airport, looking really cool with your nice new iPad, writing some groovy APL code. Samsung Galaxy as opposed to Ford Galaxy, which is a whole different thing altogether. So here is the traditional Windows-based GUI front-end. If you are a user that uses the TTY version, you typically see something which is a little bit more basic. And this is the 80 by 45 text box thing that is OK, does a fantastic job. But again, we can't get the features in that give you the development environment that uh, the people are used to on Windows. So if we look at this thing, essentially what we've got here is we've got a huge monolithic 5 megabyte interpreter. Okay, it's a single executable that runs on, on the machine. It's comprised of the, the interpreter bits, and then there's various bits of code that are providing this user interface that you can use. These partitions are not to scale. There are, incidentally, at the last count, um, took me a week to count it. Uh, about a quarter of a million lines of source code in the, in the interpreter, providing both the interpreter engine 
and all the, the user interface. I, th I suspect more, more of that is the user interface than is the interpreter these days. The user interface itself, of course, is divided into two different implementations all within the interpreter. There's the code that's driving this TTY character-based stuff, and then we've got code that's drive, driving the, the graphical front end, the, the GUI, the graphical user interface. And of course, there are different sections of code for the Wine, for the main win, for the Windows Mobile um, ports, and other. Other, in this case, incidentally, pretty much means Windows Desktop, which doesn't have a slight <coughs> code, but the other thing that we did quite a lot of. So really what we want to do is we want to take this user interface stuff and separate it, move it away from the interpreter in our, in our code base, first of all, and also perhaps in your experience as well when you use the interpreter. We want to put some sort of partition between these things so that we can develop these things independently. And that, if we get this right, what this will allow us is to have an interpreter engine running on the machine or running somewhere um, and a user interface which is a separate entity which communicates with the interpreter engine. I think that a lot of the other APLs do this already and we're some 20 years late to this particular party. But if we get this right, then we can communicate between processes on a single machine, we can communicate between different interpreter architectures on a single machine, 32, 64 bit and so on. We may even be able to communicate across machines, so you can use the new user interface to get across machines to debug something which is in a, a locked room somewhere. And hopefully we can get around the little problem we have with Bill getting in the way. Bill! Let me talk a little bit about Bill getting in the way. This is, of course, as is the case with everything these days that doesn't work on your computer, it's an issue related to security. Essentially it comes down to how we need to debug ASP.NET processes. On um, Windows XP and Windows Server, basically all the Windows operating systems before Vista, if you had an error in your ASP.NET application, um, we could pop up a dialog interpreter on the desktop, we could debug it, we could fix your, you know, your code, and um, save your workspace and everything would be fine and your application would carry on. Unfortunately, this, this notion that you might want to put something up on the screen that the user can look at is deemed to be insecure in the later versions of Windows. Which is frustrating. <laughs> Let me just illustrate that with a few slides here, just to pad out the time because we'll be done by half past if I'm not careful. <coughs> here is a typical example of an APL um, sample website that comes with Dialog APL 12.1. It's got a simple button that says press me, and when you press the button, the text in the button is supposed to rotate round by a character. No, actually, it flips, it, it reverses each time you press the button. If you get your APL code wrong, when you press the button, you may get an error popping up in the browser that says there's been a value error on line 4 of your function or whatever. Typically, on Windows XP and Server 2003, we can pop up a session behind here, okay, and the error that I have on line 5, although I think the message said 4, there's something wrong with the projector. Um, <laughs> <coughs> clearly I had a reference to a game that doesn't exist. Um, in that function. So we could pop this up, we could edit the function, fix the function, branch the product, and the website would work out. The problem we've got is because Bill, oh, Bill, we can't pop this thing up. Okay, so we need a new way of being able to debug this ASP.NET process without actually, without using this, the same process that is the ASP.NET thing to get something on the desktop. That's what Ride is going to try and do for us. <coughs> So that's a security issue. Bill doesn't allow us to get to the desktop on Windows Server, Windows Vista, Windows Server 2008 as well. Anything that goes back from whenever it was Vista came out. So we can't use an all ID to debug this thing. So to summarise, what we're trying to do is we're trying to separate the user interface from the interpreter. And this will allow us to provide a consistent interface to all the interpreters. The Dialog APL interpreters, the APL Sharp interpreter, a Unix interpreter, a, a Windows interpreter, interpreters that you might have scattered around on a variety of machines, a variety of different windows, a variety of different uh, Unixes. This will allow us to simplify internally at Dialog our interpreter development. The guys working on the interpreter don't need to worry about the knock-on effects of the guys that are working on the user interface. 
and clearly vice versa. We can develop the user interface without worrying about whether this is going to break any interpreter code. This will allow us to develop cross-platform um, integration better for new platforms. We will be able to support all of the dialogue languages and we'll be able to get around that Vista desktop security issue. So we come up with this thing called Ride. Ride, of course, is a remote, integrated development environment. I had all sorts of ideas. I was going to call it Excite, an external integrated testing environment. <laughs> but um, I couldn't think of any funny ones, so I thought I'd better stick with Ride. Um, but that's what it is, and that's what hopefully I'm going to show you a prototype, typical or a pre-alpha. I don't know what pre-alpha is. It's an empty, empty array joke. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to show you a very early version of, the, of this to give you an indication of the sorts of things that we'll be able to do, to do with it and what it might look like. What it is, is it's a separate user interface that can pick it back onto existing interpreters. So what, the, what we have at the moment is we have a version of 12.1 of the interpreter that's had a few minor modifications done to it so that we have this separate URI that can be used in addition to the existing GUI. Okay, so while I've been talking about separating the two things, the first steps are to um, duplicate some user interface stuff so that in most cases you can use the environment you're used to while we're developing the, the new ride UI which will take you back onto the top of the interpreter. We're using a portable toolkit to provide a consistent user interface across all of the platforms where we want to provide support for the user interface. We want this to be easily deliverable to users. We're going to make this thing can be delivered over the internet. And we've chosen to use Silverlight as the implementation toolkit for this user interface. Silverlight being a Microsoft toolkit that sits on top of .NET, uh, which will be portable because it will sit on top of Mono, which is available on the Linux machines, and in the fullness of time will be available on a lot of the portable devices. The Silverlight is used just to develop the the user interface. The communication between the, the UI and the interpreter is all socket based and XML based. So we can abstract, we can remove the UI at any point and plug it anywhere in there. Or in fact the UI can talk to any language engine that, that follows the, the protocol that we've set up for the TCP IP communication. Which means that we can use it with APL now, we can use it with APL sharp, we can use it with whatever the next dialogue language might be, or any other language that comes along that wants to be part of this ride family. So, that's the PowerPoint. Now, before we begin, though, <coughs> I have a small disclaimer that I want to make. <coughs> William Shakespeare said <coughs> that all of the world is a stage and we're all merely players. This is a setup for a silly joke. In 1885, Stage magazine wrote that the, word, the phrase to win indicates the capacity to play a role without knowing the text. Okay? From which we get the phrase winging it, which is what I will be doing today. I will be giving something with, which I haven't done before. I will be improvising my sweet little trousers off. So we'll see how it goes. So it's going to go one of two ways. It's going to go really well. <laughs> It's going to go. It's either going to go really well or really badly, and uh, we'll see. So that's the end of the PowerPoint, Lordy. So the first demonstration I'll give is is actually addressing the <coughs> the security problem, the the, the desktop um, ASP.NET problem. Here I have a browser which is displaying. Some of the dialog APL sample websites that we show um, that are shipped, sorry, with 12.1. This page, this page works as advertised. We can type in some numbers, 234, and we can add 123 to 234. We hit the sum button, and we get the expected answer back, which is 357. Big tick. Okay, great. What we've got here is the, the page that, we, the, the, that I demonstrated in the, uh, in the PowerPoint earlier. And normally, if, well, if this page was to work, we just rotate the text. But because it's broken, when I press the button, we get the there it says function reverse calls a value error on line four. Now, because this is Windows 7 that I'm running here, 
we're not able at this stage to pop up the interpreter so that we can fix the problem. So this is where ride comes in. If I start the ride UI, for which I have a shortcut on my desktop, what we get here is a welcome page, which is fairly, fairly bland, but what it has, it has a list of IP addresses on the left. And there we can see that in this drop-down list on the right, we have the system has detected at this local IP address a process that is running that is um, running. I haven't got a pointer because my known my private pointer. Is that punishment? Is that like some British boarding school punishment thing? <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm just going to do that. Don't go away just yet. <laughs> 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 Are you going to kiss me first? <laughs> <laughs> right, anyway, so what we've got here is we have. Over here, Darwin Limited, those fantastic people, have got a process which is running <coughs> with APL, which is a 32 bit Unicode version of the APL, and it is residing within this process called W3WT, which is the process on the computer, which is your, your web server, and it's running under a username called Classic.net application. If we If we select this guy and press the connect button, what we get okay, is we get something that looks a little bit like a session. The, um, unfortunately, I've had to change my screen resolution as I put the projector <coughs> in, so let me just jiggle this around a little bit. So this is a thing that looks a little bit like an API session. I can type 2 plus 2. I can type 1, 2, 3, plus 4, 5, 6. Okay, and we, we get API. Now, however, though, if I come back over here and repress this button, okay, where this would previously just pop up a message to say there's been a value error on line XYZ of the function, what happens now is in our remote IDE, we get exactly the message that we would get in a regular interpreter session. There's been a value error on line four of a function called we And this is not a security issue? Um, the security issues we will address as a separate issue with the socket communication. Okay, we could, at the moment we're not using secure sockets, but we will use secure sockets so that the information that's going between the two things is protected. Okay. I mean, in, terms, in view of Microsoft? In view of Microsoft terms, I don't know what the security risk was in the first place. Uh -huh. But, you know, all this is, it's an, all this is, <laughs> Uh, I mean, no, I seriously, I mean, I don't know why an application can't pop up something on a desktop. It, it's running as a user that has limited rights, so it can't actually do anything anyway. So, 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 you know, so what is the deal? All this is, is an application that's doing everything that the other application would have done as a user who's got more permissions now, uh, who is in a position to cause more damage, um, and he's had to do it. I, 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 I don't know. I don't understand it. But, you know, again, you know, this, this ASP.NET issue we've got is, you know, is one of the factors that takes us down this ride route. Um, it's a solution that needs a problem, fortunately, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, we work a lot like that. It's a problem that needs a solution, and fortunately the solution to the other problem, the portability, is, is solved at the same time. More than I think the problem is that the team may be in the team room right now, there's personnel that were not authorised to deal with that. Yeah, sure, but I mean, it's, I, I, I can't see why we're not at least given the choice, you know. Um, you, you, can, you can configure the, the, setting, the system as it is on XP or 2003 to either pop up the development environment or not, and it's entirely your choice, so it just seems bizarre that you're allowed to. Anyway. Uh, well, I'm sure the How does it detect the process? Does the process... Uh, some Essentially, there's a handshake. It opens a socket and there's a communication that goes on to make sure that it's talking to other things. So it tries all the processes through the list of Not, No, what happens is that the, the process itself creates a socket and then the ride connects to the appropriate sockets on the appropriate okay. place.
I, I don't need at the, I don't want at the moment to get into the details. There's 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 actually a proxy layer that we go through as well, where, where we can configure things to allow certain things through and other things through. But for the purposes of this, you know, there's there's the UI and there's the ride, and they have something between them. Anyway, right now the other thing that I've done, which unfortunately because the screen resolution has to come down because of the projector, is that I increased the size of my font because I figured it was going to be bigger, um, and then of course it became smaller because it was angled by 600, not a billion, by a million or whatever. So, you, you know, the text here does look a bit large, but I'm sure you can imagine that if you're on a bigger resolution screen, I'm going too slowly, <laughs> um, then, then, it, then it would look a lot neater as well. Anyway, so what we've got here is we've got a value error on line four of everything called reverse. So if I hit the fairly standard um, keyboard shortcut, which is control enter, okay, then hopefully, fingers crossed, what we should see, Doing anything. Yeah. There's a blip. Let's just have a look. Yeah. Okay, the tragedy side of the Shakespeare is kicking, kicking in. It's. Uh, I knew it was slow first. Right. Okay. Let's let's about let's um, restart this and see if we can try again. Let's close that. Oh no, not that one. I don't want to show you code, Lordy. <laughs> So let's uh, let's try this again. <coughs> right, just bear with me, poor favor. Right, I'm just going to kill this down and start again, just so that we're starting from a clean. Um... Right, let's kill that. Okay, so this, this is just going to restart W3WP. I don't know what happened there. There's our value error. If we come over here, there is our um, process running in the browser. Let's connect to that. Sorry, not the browser, in the ride session. Okay, come back over here, refresh this. There's our value error. So hopefully now, if I come over here and hit Control Enter, come on, come steady. There we go. Right. So what we've got here is here is our function reverse in a trace window that looks very much like the ones you're used to. Syntax code. Um, it's displaying a class. We've got the grey bit, which is a bit of the class that maybe we're not interested in. We've got the white bit, which is our function, which has generated the error. And you can see that this function takes some arguments called args. What it does is it's going to rotate the text of the first thing that is in arms, but I can't spell even a simple four-letter word. Actually, I can spell simple four-letter words, I just press our arms. So what we need to do, shift enter, um, insert position there, press. First thing you, when, whenever you get Windows 7, the first thing you do is you switch off this little feature that means if you move your cursor over the bottom corner that you have a heart attack. <laughs> right, anyway, so, so what, when I press R here, what will happen is obviously the code will miraculously start working, but you'll notice that the syntax colouring also kicks in after a few seconds and that changes from red to <coughs> the appropriate colour for a low local variable. We can hit escape, fix the <coughs> function, and then back over in our session. At the moment, at the moment, the syntax colouring is done at the interpreter side. Okay. What I think we will end up doing is bringing the syntax analysis engine into the UI side um, as a sort of external plugin, so that different languages can specify which syntax engine they want to use. So that um, you know, we can keep down the traffic across the interface down, and obviously it can be faster and slicker. When we come to be to use more of the syntax coloring information, like we do with the interpreter, I don't know those of you that are familiar, excuse me, with the 12.1 editor where we have sort of collapsible outlining sections and so on in the editor. All of the information for that 
is driven from the same syntax analysis engine that generates the colors. And if we want to bring that sort of editor functionality over into the, into the, um, the ride, then it makes sense to do those calculations uh, locally because we're going to need to do more calculations and get more information across. Anyway, so if we do branch the quad LC, and the ed trace goes away, and our website now does rotate the tasks that come correctly. So there is a simple example of problem B solved by the, uh, by the ride engine, allowing us to attach an external session to the ASP.NET process that is ready. Okay. Now, the other thing issue that we wanted to address was this idea of cross-platform development. We have support for many different types of Unix with our uh, interpreter product. Some of those products already have a, a GUI interface written in um, Wine or Mainwin. We used to have an X product, which is the native um, Unix X Windows implementation to provide the GUI, but that's a product that we've not, um, we've not um, sold to anybody for oh, probably 10 years now. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to provide a, a consistent GUI interface to um, those Unix interpreters. Which meant, of course, that um, well, I needed a Unix machine to test this on. Now, I'm not a big fan of the Linuxes. Not a big fan of the AXs, because those machines are the size of the wall range. If I'm going to have a Linux machine, I'm going to have a proper Linux machine. So I went out and said, can I have a Mac, please? This, this is under, you know, this, this has got all the sexy stuff that you want from a Mac. It's just, I, I've, on days when morning get you out of the office, I just sit there and I'm just going to go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <coughs> um, so, but what we, what, so, all right, so, you know, secret of the we want this remote development environment. Um, we uh, need to be able to test this on a Unix machine. Oh, great, that's fine. Unix machine, bring this to the Mac and test it. Maybe we should get a Mac out of this <laughs> uh, and then, But then, of course, the works are, oh, God, we're going to need a Mac version of the interpreter. Oh, so, so you've got yourself away for a week and you generate a, a Mac implementation of, of that. Okay. It's only the TTY version, okay, so there's no GUI front end on this, but it does 2 plus 2. It's one better than that, it does 2 plus 3. Um, but, you know, it, it, it does all sorts of things we can do. We can, we can fix functions, uh, we can quad effects, let's just, oh, we have to switch keyboard layouts. Actually, the most, oh, it is on there already, the most time-consuming part of this process is always um, getting the keyboard layout sorted out. So here's a here's a dupe function. Let's have a trip function. Okay. So we can do dupe ten. We can do trip ten. Oh, trip one. Right, that works. Um, but you know, there's no great uh, no great GUI front end on this. I can do prem ed um, stuff, and we just get that that TTY thing that, that we wanted. What we want is a GUI front end on this. So let's come down to, down at the bottom, I'll just have to do this for a bit. Um, right, here we go, here's the dialogue right thing. Exactly the same engine that we just saw on the, on, the, on the Windows machine. Okay, but here on this machine, because we're running on the Mac now, what we should see pop up here, and once it's figured it out. Come on, come to Daddy. Right there we go. Right, so there we can see there is our process that there's the umbrella. I think it's okay to wave an open umbrellas around now. Mm -hmm. Um here, look, we have the this is open running, which is running the Mac off it's this to the new version. So we can connect to this in exactly the same way. And here's our session that's connected to this thing that contains the function of deep and trip that I, that I just fixed. Um, we can prove that it's Unix. We can do prenus h u name minus a, and it tells me that we are a. It tells me stuff. Right? 
tells me stuff that a Windows machine wouldn't tell me. So that's that's the bit there. So we can do we can do do tan, we can do trip. Um, oh yeah, cool. trip three. Oh, I like the symmetry of that. That's good. Control enter. We can trace through trip three. We can do stuff. We can load display. Oh, dot D was because it's a Unix machine. If you don't do that, then go. Oh, can't find that. Load dot D was. So there it is. We can do display. Yeah, to ten. And we can trace through that in exactly the same way that you're used to with the existing GUI interpreters. But what we've got now, behind the scenes, all we've got is a. Uh, a, a TTY version of the interpreter, and everything that I've been typing in the, um, in the ride is being echoed in the session. It really is just a remote connection to that interpreter. It's not taking everything away. If I do uh, 2 plus 3, 4, 5, um, then we'll see that in, in our session there's our 2 plus 3, 4, 5. Okay, so it's just that piggybacking user interface on the top of the interpreter that we've already got. Let's come back to this guy. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, and of course this is, this is, this is, um, uh, where do I want to go? I knew it was going to stop, it was going to fall apart. Yes, yeah, please, at any point, if anyone has a question, they can ask it or leave. So, theoretically, if a remote interface is running on a different machine or something, and you could have more than one person driving on the same session. Well, that's, that's something which at the moment will... We'll, yeah, that's at the moment, that's the sort of thing that will fall over in a big heap and the way that I'll probably... The, I, and I, we haven't yet figured out exactly how to address that. I mean, certainly I think we'd only allow one remote connection at any one time. Um, whether or not it's feasible to allow... I don't th even think it's feasible to allow sort of local interaction at the same time as remote interaction. So one might lock the other out. Um, and of course there'll be the facility on all the interpreters to enable the external connection so that if you don't want it for, for whatever reasons you, it can be prevented. But yeah, there are all those sorts of issues about if you get six people that try to connect to the all at the same time, it's going to be, it's going to be sensible. Um, and we'll address those um, when they hit the top of the list. Um, okay, so yeah, so this thing goes, goes across machines. So for example, if we go back to here and we type and actually, this example that I'm about to type now will not work for that precise reason. If I type in the name of the Windows 7 VM which is running on this Mac, which is this, oh, hold on, which is this machine here, if I type this in here and add this to the list of addresses that this ride session is aware of, oh, hold on, then what we'll see pop up in here is, is again, is that Windows ASP.NET session running on what is essentially a remote machine. The fact that it's a VM on this same piece of hardware is irrelevant. It could be the other side of the planet. And what we could have done is from this machine here, we could have debugged, from this Mac, we could have debugged the ASP.NET web server that was running on the, on the Windows machine. Um, yeah? In the, in the project column, what is it? What uh, is expected to be there? Um, what is in the project, project column, column, yeah, 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 is at the moment, typically the um, was ID. Okay, I think. Um, but one of the things that that has come up in the past um, that we may add in here is is the ability to put any user-defined token in there, so that um, you know if you've got a lot of processes running on a lot of machines, you can easily identify what job each particular one is doing with finer granularity than just the, with the workspace ID. Um, and there'll be filtering on these as well. I mean, you can see that if you connect this thing to a web file where you've got maybe 100 machines and, and multiple presses in each machine, you're going to want to be able to filter on, on various things. And those are all sort, those are the sort of the UI things that we'll put in once we know that we've got the core communication and the, the core sort of feature set doing what it needs to do. Um, okay, right, now before we move on to, to, to the other thing I wanted to show, and I'm going to show this as well, there's um, Contrived example number one. One of the things that people frequently say is, what are those guys at Dialog doing today? What you need is a Twitter feed. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So what we have, well, this little thing here, is your, is your Dialog game. Oh, Hold on. No, it was, it was going to be, no, let's try over here. What this guy over here is, 
is this is a list of Twitter feeds from, essentially from those people that you've told the system you are interested in. But there's some loon called Dial of Ryan, I have no idea who he is. Um, there's me who retweets stuff from everyone else because I've never had an original thought of my own. And down here, tut, 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 with its last update of uh, the 6th of July is, is, is dialing in here. Uh, but anyway, so the idea here is, first of all, it was with Silverlight and C Sharp and all that stuff, so writing something like this is actually really easy. So you noodle around for an afternoon and you can have a little Twitter feed all of your own. But it sort of illustrates that, um, you know, this sort of functionality is easy to slot into this sort of environment that we build this stuff up with. You know, it, yes, it's a bit of fun, but it actually, you know, there is, there is use for it. We can click on any of these and it will take us to the appropriate Twitter website for, for that individual and so on. So, a bit of a giggle, but serves a purpose as well. And actually, the other thing that's going on on this right-hand pane is uh, down the bottom we've got this thing called a debug console. If we open this guy up, you might not be able to make this out because of the size of the font. But basically what this is showing is all of the XML that's being passed between the, the UI and the interpreter. Um, uh, it's colour coded at the moment simply for replies and, and um, requests. That's, that's auto generated, you didn't actually... That's, that's all auto generated, but let me just find a bit where, for example, what happens is the... Uh, in fact, let me, let, me, let me scroll down to the bottom and see if I can type one, that would be pretty really good idea. If I type 2 plus 2 down here, it doesn't work. Okay, let's try it on this one. If I type 2 plus 2 down here, what we can see is the interpreter, not the interpreter, sorry, the UI sends a command to say, give me the syntax colors for some basis for encoded text because it might contain a terminal in the text and it's come back and said, yeah, okay, done that, I've got some, here's the reply, but it gets into its colours and here is the encoded information for the colour. So, you know, it's perf perfectly transparent. If you wanted to write something that sat on, on the correct port with the correct configuration, then you'd have to respond to this. You could even the language that did syntax coding that the ride could talk to. Okay. So you've got your, your Twitter feed because it's cool. You've got your debug console because it's tells me what's going on when I'm developing the thing. Right, now. This is me thinking. Right, well, I'm just, I'm just, gonna, sw I'm just gonna switch um, wireless connections for reasons that I don't wanna tell you and you don't care about. Let's come back to, I'm just waiting for this, this little bleeby thing here to stop moving about, which will tell me what connected is happening. Sorry? Oh, well, no, I, I, there you go. Uh, if we do that, in fact, the, what goes on here, the, the um, stuff that's sent as input and output actually doesn't appear in here because that's going down a different, different channel. But, uh, but things like, um, let's just have a look see what's in here. Uh, if I prem add foo goo, uh, let's do foo and foo two. There's foo, we'll fix that, there's foo two. If I type, oh, you might not see this, if I type an F here, okay, then what happens is we get autocomplete, but we get autocomplete because down here, oh, here we go, this thing sent a, uh, where are we, a get autocomplete command that said, I've typed this, the cursor is at position that, and the engine at the other end has come back and said, ooh, here's your options, you can have foo. Oh, and there is, sorry, can't see it. You can have foo, or you can have foo too. So it's just, you know, nothing particularly clever going on. It's just sending stuff down the socket. The stuff at the end is going, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. It um, sends some stuff back, and we wrap it up in, in the GUI. It's sort of, it's sort of, it's sort of easy, really. Um, right, but what I wanted to do was, let's come back over here. <laughs> Let me type this number in. Oh no, coming hot. This is when you need to cross your fingers. Ish. Ah, here we go. Look, look at that baby down there. So at that particular IP address, there's a Windows Mobile interpreter running, which is running a 
That's a project that's really a continual space. If we connect to this baby. But bearing in mind that we're still on the Mac at this point, so what we've got here is that we've got a Mac that is talking to a <coughs> Windows mobile version of the tablet that's sitting on this little, this little PDA thing here. Everything that I'm typing on here is, um, is yeah, Ray, fine. If I type 3 plus 3, Yes. It says three plus three, and then it says. <laughs> need a magnifying glass. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. But it says six as well. I mean, I'm not making that up at this end. Trust me, Gov. I'm a professional. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we've got is we've got this this user interface now, which which is doing, I think, the sort of things that I said it should do. It's going across platforms. Okay. Um, here we are. We're on the Mac. We're talking to a Windows mobile version of the interpreter using exactly the same user interface and incidentally at the same time as I'm talking to this um, uh, this Mac version of the interpreter here <coughs> okay so there's a Mac here's a t that's a tab that's connected to a Mac here's a tab that's connected to a Windows mobile version um, if uh, here's, here's, here's joke number zero if I type something into my lunchbox because I misspelled launch, but I thought I'm going to leave it like that. <laughs> um, what I can do, security settings permitting, is that I could start an interpreter session from the IDE. And of course, one the, the most common mode of um, use of this will be that you start the ride and it automatically starts a session for you behind the scenes, so you don't have to do this searching for, for an APL process um, and then connecting to it. You know, it would be set up so you can just do that out of the box. Now, so, so that's essentially your ride. Um, this is implemented, as I said, as a Silverlight application, okay, which basically means that um, it's deliverable over the internet. Rather than what I've been doing here, is I've been starting the ride application from my desktop because I have installed it on this machine. But the other way of getting this is just from the web browser. If I start Safari up here, Well, we'll wait for that a little bit. Then. Okay, uh, I won't find Apple because I've switched to a different router. But if I go to the URL here, which is the ride test page, which is on the Windows 7 machine, which is sitting inside this box, inside inside this machine, here we've got exactly the same user interface, but this time it's being displayed in the browser. Okay, if I right click on this, I can uninstall the instance of this application which I have previously. Um, Put on this machine, so it uninstalls it. Because it's a Silverlight managed application, it's all running in a black box. When he uninstalls it, it can take the whole thing away. It's not allowed to leave bits and pieces of itself lying around on your machine. When you uninstall it, it all goes away. And I can click on this again, and I can install the dialog right onto this interpreter, onto this computer. On a Mac, what it does is it just downloads it into the download folder. You can put it wherever you like. On Windows, it actually. Um, has the option to create a desktop shortcut, which is what I did there. So from our point of view, you know, charging issues and security issues and logging in issues aside, all we need to do to get this application to you, or we'll get updates of this application to you, is point you at the, uh, at the URL, which will always contain the, the most recent version, so you can download it, and off you go. Um, okay, so... What have I forgotten to show you? you? You can't answer that. What is the point of rhetorical questions? <laughs> yes? Um, given the Flash Apps thing is a free launch, yes. um, are there any implications for the machine running Ryan? Should the have to be anything special? Well, the, the, the machine that's running Ryan needs to have Silverlight installed. Uh, which is again a free download, which is sort of is automatically downloaded the first time you download a Silverlight application to your machine. I mean, it asks you first, um, and, but, but essentially that's it. Um, so you need application, you need Silverlight. The way the ride is configured at the moment is that it has all its keyboard bindings internally, so you don't need a translate table on the machine. You don't need a, a keyboard, particular keyboard layout installed on your machine. Although if you have one, it will use it. Um, 
But as far as the machine is the, that you want to run on is concerned, it needs Silverlight and it needs the right application. Now, Silverlight currently in, is in version 4, and version 4 is available on Mac and Windows. The Unix equivalent is called Moonlight, which Morton me mentioned in passing uh, yesterday. Um, that is currently released in version 2, but is available in beta in versions 3 and 4. So the next job that I have once we get out, once we leave here, is to, um, is to get the implementation up and running on, on those beta versions on, on the Linuxes and the Unixes rather than on the Macs. Um, so those machines would need to have the appropriate version of Moonlight installed, which is a fairly easy download and install process as well. Chris? Now, all this is very sexy. I'm not sure you mean for, for us, Darlow, to come in to see what's wrong with the, with the no, no, interpreter. No, no, no. Let's say I have a dialogue application with 50 users. Right. It might be on the web, it might be on your own machine, but it was in Georgia. Right. Could you centralize the user interface and the user interface and the user interface? I'm still not sure I completely understand, understand okay, the let's question. Say, let's say they're running something and it fails. Right. Mean. Yeah. Okay, so I get a phone call. Yeah. Right. Okay. Would there be a possibility of seeing the list of all the guys on here, and maybe they're 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 actually running in virtual processes somewhere else, maybe on another machine? Yeah. It's coming through me. Yeah. Because the, the traffic isn't that high. Just, just no, I mean I think. If I understand correctly, you can you can associate the this monitor screen here with as many different machines as you like. So you could be monitoring 50 different APL sessions that are running on 50 different machines, different user installations. Some of them might be websites. Some of them might be all application all A. All over the world. All over the world. And then you can connect to any one of them if a user's on the phone saying there's been a problem. You could at that point connect to it, um, see where it's at and do whatever you need to do with it, and then let it resume. One of the things that we might add to, I mean, there's any number of things that we might add to these, these columns here. One thing that might be useful is, is sort of a column that indicates the current location of the application. So it might say it's a desk calculator if it's, if it's buffed out with an error. It might say that it's on line four of reverse, for example. And then you can see it's a glance, or it might be color-coded to say this one stopped because it's had an error, but these green ones are running okay, but the red ones, bath, this is the one you should look at. All of those sorts of things we can we can put in to um, speed up the, the process of figuring out which one of these is, has, has bathed or which one of these you need to look at. But yeah, the idea is you can monitor lots of different machines, lots of different processes at the same time. Yeah? Yeah, thanks. Good. John, Jim. You're, you're um, right, sorry. Those are um, one of the, the sessions, they're, se they're development sessions. Runtime. They could be runtime sessions um, with this. There's no reason why not. Uh, right. If it's a runtime session, then there are no, uh, but the only default attributes are things like the colours. Uh, a, a user doesn't have colour code settings. Uh, they don't have any um, environment variables. Right. Uh, that would have been, would have been set up in uh, developers um, 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 the, in the registry in, the, uh, in Windows. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are any, any settings that um, affect the, U, the, the IDE user interface would be configurable from the user interface and wouldn't rely on any settings that were on the remote machine. Right. Things like the syntax colours, for example, while we do store colour schemes on the remote machine, the information that comes across in the reply for the get syntax colouring isn't colour specific, it's actually syntax information rather than colour information, so the colours that are then applied to that data, again, can all be set in the UI rather than expected to get it from the interpreter. Right. Jim? 
So is a dialogue interpreter on the Mac waiting for a ride to reach a certain level of sophistication? Well, I mean, the, the, whether or not we will sell a version of the interpreter for the Mac, uh, you know, we haven't said J JD's built one, we'll, great, we'll sell it. Um, it's at the moment only there so that I have a Unix-like environment to test the interaction and so on. Um, we are undecided. I think it's unlikely that, we would, that we'll do a native, native Mac GUI support. We're most likely going to wait for Mono, for example, to become available on the Mac and then do a .NET interface to that to get user GUI going. And we'll probably use the Ride for development GUI. So I wouldn't say that it was waiting for it. It's all up in the air about whether the Mac version of the interpreter is a real interpreter or whether it's just something that I'm using for development. We really don't know what the customer base would be for the Mac interpreter. I mean, the guys at the back could probably jump in at this point if they've got anything to add. For me, it was a technical exercise um, so that I could plug it into Ride. I wasn't thinking of it being a commercial thing at all. But there may be people who disagree with me. What's the interpreter written in these days? Is it when it runs over the Mac? It's still, written in, it's still written in C. It's just written in plain, normal, everyday, okay. boring C. Anything else? Uh, uh, um, um, I'll come here first, then I'll come back to Kai. Uh, uh, because you're planning to, to make the, the, the port configurable. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the whole everything should be configurable. There's, there'll be security layer, layers and all sorts of stuff. Um, again, my focus at the moment is just to be to make sure that we can build a UI, that we can communicate, that everything will work, and then we'll throw as much security at it as, as, as we need to make it safe for people like yourselves to use. Kai? would like to hear something about multi-threaded applications. Um, one of the other things that I have to do when I get back is improve the, the debugging element of this for multi-threading. The debugging of multi-threaded applications via Ride will be different to how it is in the current GUI because I think it's fairly widely accepted that it's sort of too difficult in the GUI that we have at the moment. Um, so that part of the design of, of Ride is still in the design stage how precisely how debugging of multi-threaded applications is going to be. You, it will be better than it is in the current terms. One of the nice things about doing this is, is that we can, certainly, uh, definitely at this stage, we can throw great swathes of, swathes of this away and rewrite bits of the GUI in, inside Ride. The other advantage we've got, we've got <laughs> is that we can just bring across from the existing GUI those bits that we like leave behind what we don't like. We're open to any suggestions that you have about, you know, what <coughs> elements you want to see in the UI that we don't currently have, you know, what, what we should definitely change. And the, the threading support is one of those things that... Well, it's something I've been trying for years now, is now I think getting even more data, maybe There's something like what trades run or what trades do. Yeah. Um, all of those things will... The, certainly the UI elements we'll address within Ride. And any language um, issues that come out um, that need changing as well, you know, will be up for discussion and will be discussed. <laughs> All right. Um, right, I've got, there's one minute left. So if there's no other questions, um, I'll let Morton come and swap over. And if anyone does have any questions about this or anything else, then obviously I'm here until Friday morning. So come and find me. If you want another demonstration one-on-one. One thing just comes to my mind. <coughs> Sorry, a problem with? It was very difficult to trace applications which used lost focus and lost focus right. or less associated with them because yes. the tracing was uh, interfering with them. And, and th yeah, this, this will get around that. As long as you're running on two different machines, then the focus issues are completely separate. So your changes of focus because you're using the UI will have no effect on the events that are generated on the... Uh, on the client machine. So, yeah, good point. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions I should take privately later, but th thank you for your attention. Cheers.